Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with the mid-year book freakout tag. I really can't believe it, but we are in fact actually just about halfway through 2021. Uh, and so far I have to say 2021 has been a pretty great reading year for me. At this time last year, I really couldn't think of more than a couple of books that I'd given five stars to, but this year has been uh, a really great reading year for me thus far. Uh, and this is one of my favorite tags to do every year, and I love to see everybody's rendition on this. Uh, so let's just get right into the questions. The first question is, what is the best book that you have read so far this year? Uh, and I think on an objective level, I have to say Moby Dick. And maybe it's not really an objective level because clearly a lot of people don't like Moby Dick. A lot of people have really great criticisms of it. Uh, and I think it is typically a book that you either love or you hate. So maybe it's not an objective choice. But given that it's a classic, I feel like objectively, it is better written than a lot of the things that I've read so far this year, but it's also just a book that I wound up really loving. And I've always had the sense that I might get on with Moby Dick, uh, but I never knew that it would be such an electrifying experience, such a memorable reading experience. And it's a book that has definitely stuck with me. Uh, and so this is one that I think is probably also going to remain towards the top for me for the rest of the year. I fully expect to see Moby Dick uh, on my favorites list at the end of this year. But another book that has really stuck with me and that I think can really contend for my favorite book of the year uh, is A Brightness Long Ago by Guy Gabriel Kay. This is such an utterly fantastic novel and I think it probably won't work well for everyone in a similar way to Moby Dick. I think it's going to have its fans and I think it's going to have its haters uh, because this is a really oddly structured book, let's call it. In many ways, I think you struggle to feel connected to the characters here, but in other ways, you also don't feel like that's the point of the book. The point of the book is not necessarily to be invested in the characters themselves. So I think what sticks out for me with Guy Gabriel K is not necessarily the characterization. Uh, it's actually more of maybe the vibe, the aesthetics, the world building, uh, and certainly his prose. Uh, I really think he is an incredible writer and I think he has a real deep understanding of language. And this is a really lushly written book and I truly, truly loved it. I've also read another of Guy Gabriel Kay's books earlier in the year, but this is the one that has stuck with me a little bit longer. Uh, and so I think Maybe it's due to recency bias, as I did read this one second to the other, but this is definitely one that also is potentially my favorite book of the year. The second question is the best sequel that I have read so far this year, and for me that is Flame Fall by Rosaria Munda. I almost named this as my favorite book of the year, but I knew it would pop up for this question, so I didn't want it to do double duty, but this book it was absolutely incredible. It's the second in the Fireborn series or the Aurelian cycle, but the first book was called Fireborn, and it is truly a masterful political fantasy. I wish everybody was reading this. I'm shocked that I don't hear more about this series because it is really, truly, incredibly tightly plotted. I mean, everything feels as though it has its place, but more than anything, you feel connected to the characters. Uh, where with Guy Gabriel K, I would say the characters don't matter to me, frankly, uh, so much as his writing style does. Uh, in Flamefall, the characters mean far more to you than the writing style. Uh, on an objective level, maybe this isn't the best written work that I've read all year. Maybe it's not the most beautiful in terms of prose, but in terms of characterization, it is absolutely spectacular. And it's a rare thing where the second book in a trilogy actually outshines the first for me. And that's what this one did. Number three is a new release that you still need to get to. Uh, and for me, that is Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. Uh, so this was my book of the month pick for May, I think it was. Uh, and it has been sitting on my shelf staring at me uh, because prior to picking this up, 
I heard nothing but good things about it. As soon as it came out, as soon as people started reading it as their book of the month choice, I heard it was really, really slow. Uh, and so that has made me a little bit more apprehensive about it than I think I would have been otherwise. I've always been fond of Ariadne and Greek myth, and so I am interested to see a retelling that is centered around her. And more excitingly, Jennifer Saint's next book, is going to be about Electra, who is my favorite female character from Greek myth. I am so excited about that. Uh, and so I want to see how she handles Ariadne so that I can uh, kind of temper my expectations for her book on Electra that's going to come out next year. Number four is my most anticipated release for the second half of the year. And I have two. Both of these revolve around the Wars of the Roses. Both of them are Wars of the Roses historical fiction. Uh, and the first of these is Cecily by uh, Annie Garthwaite. I had heard nothing about this until I heard Aoife from uh, Words of Clover mention it on her channel a couple of weeks ago. And this is a historical fiction centering around Cecily Neville, who was the mother of Edward IV and Richard III. And so her husband kind of conspired to become king. A lot went on in her life. It was a very tragic life because she outlived all of her sons. I don't think she outlived all of her daughters, but she certainly outlived all of her sons. Uh, and so she lived a really, really long, interesting life, and she saw every bit of the Wars of the Roses. She saw it in its entirety. And the description of this one has me thinking that it might be written in a style similar to Wolf Hall, uh, and it's going to be kind of experimental in terms of its prose. I hope that's the case. If not, I probably won't be too disappointed. Uh, but I'm really excited about this, and I do hope that it tries to do something new with historical fiction. Uh, and so I'm really, really looking forward to this. This comes out in July. My other most anticipated release is coming out in September, and it's by Anne O'Brien, who was a really famous historian fiction author, and she is writing a book about the Paston family. The Paston family are actually the reason that we know so much about the Wars of the Roses. Nearly all of their letters have survived. They were incredible record keepers, and they kept letters that they received and also took back letters that they sent to other members of their family. And so it's actually because of them that we know so much about kind of the domestic aspects of the Wars of the Roses, about families who switched back and forth. Uh, and so I'm really, really looking forward to this. I think she's basing this around three of the women in the Paston family. I tend to really like Anne O'Brien. I'm really excited that she's going to go back to Wars of the Roses. Uh, so this is another of my most anticipated releases for the second half of the year. My biggest disappointment, I think we all know what I'm going to say. It was Sister Song by Lucy Holland. I have talked about how disappointing this book was to me in many different places. Uh, and so sadly enough, this one just really was not for me. I think my expectations were too high. And I think too, I expected something from the book that it was never going to give me. I think I wanted the book to be something that it is not. Uh, and it is just a really frustrating read. I think you find yourself really frustrated with the characters throughout this book. But perhaps the most disappointing thing about it is that it feels like on every level it should have worked for me because it's set in the Dark Ages and kind of a semi-Arthurian time period. There's a bit of magic in it, and it's also a retelling of an old English folk ballad, and that seemed in particular like it should have worked very well for me. Uh, and so unfortunately, this was just a massive disappointment for me on every level. Number six is your biggest surprise of the year. And so I had to say The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I thought I would probably like this. That's why I took a chance on it to begin with, is because I thought I would probably like it, but I didn't think I would love it as much as I did. This was another contender for a favorite of the year for me, because this book is so exquisitely written. It is so beautifully drawn. Everything that he says about the city of Rome is so lush and descriptive that you honestly feel like you're there. You feel like you're with him and he's telling you about all of these monuments. And then how he describes certain of the characters, it's just amazing. I just found this to be a really stunning work of literature. And it might be now my favorite American classic 
after Moby Dick. I have to say Moby Dick is probably my favorite American classic now, uh, but The Marble Fawn is a close second. I really, really enjoyed this, and it has been very encouraging to me that I might in the future be willing to pick up more Nathaniel Hawthorne. I've been put off of him before, uh, so I'm really looking forward now to kind of revisiting some of the stuff that I have read by him that I didn't think I liked, that I read in school and didn't like. Uh, so maybe this experience will help me try some new things with Nathaniel Hawthorne. Number seven is your new favorite author, and I have to say that's Guy Gabriel Kay. Uh, so I read A Brightness long ago in May, but in February I read The Last Light of the Sun. That is a more Viking-inspired fantasy. This is a more Italian Renaissance-inspired fantasy. That Viking fantasy, though, was so exquisite because there was a character in it who was clearly meant to be Alfred the Great, and I think he did it so wonderfully. It was just such a spectacular read. This also has some kind of parallels to the real world in terms of characterization and places, uh, but this has one of the best chapters I've read in fantasy that is about a version of the Palio race that they run each year in Siena, and it is just a really heart-pounding chapter. It's really action-packed, and it's very easy to visualize. So not only is Guy Gabriel Kay attracted to the same periods in history that I am, but his writing is just really, really beautiful. That's really really what I would say about him and that's why I would recommend him to people is that I just think the way that he writes is amazing. I'm looking forward to picking up more Guy Gabriel K uh, in the second half of the year, definitely. So I'm going to combine questions eight and nine, which are your newest fictional crush and your new favorite character, because for me they are one and the same, and that's Prince Mishkin of The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Prince Mishkin is so soft and sweet. He's such a really good person. And to compare him to another character that I really, really loved this year, uh, if you have watched Ragnarok on Netflix, which is a Norwegian show where a boy is essentially given the powers of Thor and Ragnarok is going to be acted out in this uh, Norwegian town. And the boy who is given the power of Thor, his name on the show is Magne, he is such a good, kind-hearted person and he struggles so deeply with making good decisions and making sure that he is staying true to himself and that he's always being a good person. He never assumes bad or ill intent in other people. He always accepts them. He's really forgiving. He really feels guilt when he does something that he perceives as wrong. Uh, and so I definitely see shades of Prince Mishkin in him. And that's the way that Prince Mishkin is. He's just such a really profoundly good person. Uh, and there are parts of this book that do frustrate you because there is one instance in particular where somebody has really shown their true colors, that they mean him harm, and he automatically forgives them. And the next time they show up, he's over that. And you as the reader are thinking, Mishkin, are you that naive? Are you that foolish? And then you realize you bought into the rest of the book. Everyone else in the book thinks that Prince Mishkin is an idiot because he is so naive, because he is so good-hearted. Uh, and then you realize, okay, he's actually doing what we should all be doing. We should all be really forgiving. We should all be really accepting. We should always try to give people another chance. That's certainly not feasible 90% of the time, uh, but wouldn't it be nice if most people were like Prince Mishkin? Number 10 is a book that made you cry. For me, this is Warlord by Bernard Cornwell. This was Happy Tears. Uh, this was the last in his Saxon stories or the Last Kingdom series. It feels weird to say this about a book about Vikings, but this was honestly a really heartwarming entry in the series. It was the perfect ending to the series, frankly. And so my tears were not really sad that it's over but happy that I experienced it, happy that I'm going to get to go back and reread the series again. Uh, I often feel like with series enders, when I read the last book in a series, and this is not only for books, when I watch like the last episode of a television show, uh, I often feel like the door closes on it and I'm never going to revisit that series. And so in many ways, I never want to finish series. Uh, and so I was really, really hesitant 
about reading the last book in the Saxon Stories series because it is my favorite. But that was not my experience at all. My experience was not that I'll never read this again, I'll never pick up this series again. It was that I could pick up any book in the series tomorrow and I would be just as happy with it as I was the first time. It didn't feel like the series ended, it felt like I had gained a friend. It felt like Uhtred, the main character, has become a friend for me for life. And so I'm going to be able to reread these at any time. And it doesn't feel as though the door shut on the series to me. It didn't feel conclusive. This felt more like a beginning. It didn't feel like ending a series. It felt like beginning a new story for Uhtred at the end of the book. And it was just absolutely perfect. Uh, so the tears I cried at this were happy tears. They weren't sad tears. Number 11 is a book that made you happy, and for me, this is A Room with a View by E.M. Forster. I listened to this back at the beginning of the year, back in January, and I just truly loved it. It has weirdly enough stuck with me throughout the past six months. It felt very sunny, very sun-drenched. It was set in Florence for the most part in Italy, which is largely why I enjoyed it. I will admit that. It just felt like a very springy summertime book. It felt like a book that is appropriate to read outside, where the flowers are blooming, where the sun is out, there's no clouds in the sky. It felt felt like a book that you should read on a picnic, if that makes sense. And so I just really think about this book pretty often, and it always makes me smile. Uh, so this is definitely a book that made me happy. Number 12 is the most beautiful book that you have gotten or received so far this year. And for me, that is The Viking Great Army and the Making of England. Isn't it just stunning? I mean, I just love the cover. I am obsessed with the cover. I pre-ordered this. It came out back in May. So far, I'm about halfway through it. I've not been all that enthused with the book itself, uh, but its outward cover, it's just absolutely beautiful. I'm really, really happy with what it looks like. Uh, for the most part, the inside of the book is retreading old ground for me. Uh, they're regurgitating a lot of information that I already know, and I thought this was going to be, for the most part, um, newer information, newer archaeological information. And so in that regard, it's been a little bit disappointing, but it is just absolutely beautiful. And I have no doubt that the second half of the book will be all about their new research. Last but not least, number 13 is which books do you need to read before the end of the year? And I'm always very lenient with myself on this question, and so I will continue to be lenient with myself. Uh, I don't necessarily have anything that I need to do before the end of the year, but one book that I really, really want to get to that has been on my TBR for years, but that I feel particularly inspired to pick up soon is Notre Dame de Paris by Victor Hugo. I feel like it's time to read this because recently I was listening to um, an audiobook of, I think it was First Love by Ivan Turgenev. And in the book, they had an argument about Victor Hugo versus Lord Byron. And I thought, how on earth can they even compare the two of them? But then it hit me architecture. We're going to be talking about medieval architecture, ancient architecture. And so I just have ever since then felt the pull to picking this up and I think I will probably read it very soon. So this is one that I would definitely like to get to before the end of the year. There are of course many that are on my yearly TBR for my Napoleon project that I would also really like to make sure that I get to before the end of the year. But it is now looking more likely that that project will fold over into 2022, uh, so I'm not gonna be too stressed about that. So that was the mid-year book freak out tag. I would love to know down below, uh, if you were meeting your goals for the year, what's the best book that you've read so far this year? What's your most disappointing read? And if you haven't done this tag yet, consider yourself tagged. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.